Hi, it's Carol from BookReporter.com, and I'm here with our latest Book Reporter Talks to interview with Jilly McMillan. Hello. It is so nice to have you here. I confess that The Nanny is the first book of yours that I read, and it's going to definitely be a bets on selection. It's not going to be the last that I read. Oh. I was so, so, so impressed. Um, what you've got here is a great mix of setting, character, and plot and it all just completely works. And I wanna just take a look at the cover because you know so many times you judge a book by the cover? This is one you definitely can because you've got this image in the background of a person, you don't know quite who it is. You've got this house with just the light on, you've got the nanny, and then you've got this one line down here. And I really feel that they've distilled exactly why I wanna be into this book, so. I completely agree and I think the very, well, there's lots to love here i absolutely adore it i love the fact you can't make out who this person can't is. make it out tantalizing little earring but what i love most is the tagline who loves you more who loves you more it's creepy and <laughs> who loves you more is so creepy in this book because well tell us a little bit about it tell us a little about like who could be loving you more in this book <laughs> well the book is about uh, a girl called jocelyn she's seven years old and one night her nanny who she loves very very much Mm -hmm. more in fact than her own mother, mm -hmm. uh, disappears overnight um, without any explanation and Justin wakes up and is distraught. Uh, the main story of the book takes place 30 years later when she has to return to the family home through tragic circumstances. Mm -hmm. She has a daughter of her own and she has to um, figure out how to get along with her mother. Mm -hmm. She feels like she's regressed, as we all do when we go home. And they have definitely a strained relationship. They have an extremely strained relationship for lots of complicated reasons. And one day there's a knock on the door and there's a woman who says, I was your nanny. And that's one of the plot lines in the book, as you know, mm -hmm. um, is it her? Isn't it her? If it is her nanny, what does she want? And why did she leave? Yes. And if it isn't her, who is it? Mm -hmm. And it was so long ago that she has memories of her, but something doesn't feel completely connecting, but she needs the help. She needs the help at this point. Because she and her mother have this very fractured kind of relationship, and she's looking for somebody to help her with her daughter, but she's putting a lot of pressure on, this is going to be the right person for me. She really is, and, and you're right, she's desperate for the help. Mm -hmm. She has to rebuild her life, she mm -hmm. has no money, she, her husband has passed away. She's trying to make something for her daughter Ruby, who she loves very, very much. And she wants life to be different for Ruby than it was for her, because she grew up in this English country house environment. And she also grew up with a mother who was cold, really and the cold. nanny was somebody who was warm. So when Hannah, who's the nanny, shows up again and walks in the door, she's remembering this person that she loved, that she was very, very, very connected to. But she doesn't feel, I feel that same way towards Hannah right now. She feels like she needs her, but I don't see her feeling the same love. No, I think she's searching for it. She's looking for it. She wants it so badly because she's lonely. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you're right. She's, she doesn't find it right away. There's a nervousness. There's a little bit of also, I think that this woman left and there's a little bit of a betrayal because yes. this woman left me with my mother who was this cold, overbearing kind of personality. And now you're back. And what kind of role are you gonna play? And if you're with my daughter, I need you to be with my daughter, but I want you to be careful with my daughter. There's definitely that. I think there's also guilt mm -hmm. because she was led to believe that it was her bad behavior that made the nanny leave so she feels worried she feels she has to apologize for something too so that's another layer of awkwardness there's all sorts of it's very soft ground between the two and it's and everything's going on is very very subtle because it's very proper yes and because you're in a <laughs> very, very proper home yes. because you're in this you're in this fabulous house think like a Downton Abbey big beautiful lake like it's called lake house lake hall lake hall lake yes, hall even grander so even grander <laughs> you're in lake hall and there's a lot of proprietary that goes there. Virginia is Lady Holt. You know, she's she, yes, she's Lady Holt. She's extremely grand. She's a member of the British aristocracy and proud of it. And she's been taught to behave a certain way and certain um, modes of behavior have been expected of her mm -hmm. um, for a very long time, which is also an interesting thing because you wonder how she feels deep down 
about because that. I think her emotions have been pushed down for so many years of how she I don't think she knows how she really feels and then all of a sudden she's got this granddaughter that she really has bonded with and Ruby yes. is really excited about being with the grandmother and meanwhile Joe doesn't have that great relationship with her mother but Ruby does and Ruby's doing all kinds of fun things with grandma and I think that's really a hard time for your, her to be grappling with. Joe is like, well, wait a second. I don't have that relationship with my mom. How can you have it? You know? I love that tension um, that comes with the relationship between generations. I think it's fascinating. And we all know that grandparents get away with mm -hmm. a little bit more when, mm -hmm. they're, when they're looking after their grandchildren than parents maybe do. Um, and I think in this book, that has a slightly more sinister edge sometimes because there are times when Jo looks at her mother and thinks, well, do I really know you and what really happened 30 and years ago? And that becomes a little frightening, her closeness to Ruby. Yeah, and it's like, oh, you're, you're having all these influences on your child. I don't know if I want you to be, right. but I need you. I need yes. everybody at this point yes. right now because I am so alone. And her, her father has died suddenly, who she was closer to than her yes. mother and her husband and there's no money. So it's that real catch-22 kind of a thing. Um, when I have to say that Sherry LaPena's quote about this book, with its buried secrets, shifting allegiances, and creeping sense of dread, the nanny pulses with tension right to its shocking conclusion. And I think that is a really good line to be describing this it's book. A great line. I was <laughs> really, really happy when I read that. Thank it's you, Sherry. It's a completely, <laughs> completely, yeah. completely pulling it along. So, um, your books have had missing people in before, but this one is kind of switched up with someone coming back. So what inspired somebody coming back in this book? Well, I was talking to my agent, Helen. Mm -hmm. um, we were throwing around ideas for this book, and we talked about how so many thrillers have that missing individual, and I've written my debut, uh, What She Knew Has a Missing Child, um, so I've done it. Right. Um, and then we thought, well, what if someone comes back? What if we flip it? Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about that and we thought, what if it's a parent that you never knew comes back? And then we thought, but DNA would tell you. So we talked about who else is very close in a family, who gets right in and knows everything. And it, it was a na the nanny, mm -hmm. obviously the nanny. And their ability to form super close relationships with your children, mm -hmm. if you're the parent, we thought might be quite sinister looked at through a thriller. I will absolutely say that. And you're writing the chapters of Virginia and Joe both in the first person, which I found was so interesting because when you're with them, you feel like you're in both of their heads. So you're seeing, but the, the chapters of the nanny, like wherever that's happening, there's a lot of italics going on. There's, there are different things that differentiate this book. Was that your thought right from the beginning or did that evolve as you were going along? The um, chapters that tell the backstory for the, the nanny, Hannah, they came in, I'd say it was about a third of the way through mm -hmm. when we thought we need to give this story a bit more substance. Mm -hmm. We need to explain why Hannah is the way she is. Um, and we thought it'd be fun to show that, or I thought it'd be fun to show that third person. Yeah. Because um, I already had the two voices going on, so another first person would have been terribly been confusing. Too complicated, yeah. yeah. And also, you don't really want Hannah in the first person because Hannah is unreliable. So Hannah's story actually had to be in the third person because you're just telling it because she wouldn't have told it that way. Right. She would have been telling her story. Uh, she would have been lying. She's lying enough in the rest of the book. Yes, yeah, she is. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. so she, she wouldn't have worked. But it's interesting. Was writing first person difficult with... Um, I've seen it sometimes with one of the characters, but I don't know if I've seen it that much with two. Two different characters who are both being written in first person. Do you know, you're only just making me think and consider that <laughs> now. I'm glad I didn't sweat it. <laughs> um, it I, works. It thank works. You. It totally works. <laughs> yeah, um, don't worry about it. I think because Virginia's voice was so distinct, mm -hmm. I had a very clear idea that I wanted a very upper class British voice, very Downton Abbey. Um, so it was very straightforward to change the tone and it's Joe her daughter. Chair. When I read her parts, I'm sitting up in, in my well, chair so a lot you more. Should, yeah. so, well, I should, yeah. right? Um, Joe was easier, was a more, I suppose, I don't really believe in regular foe, but a more regular person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so she's it, Americanized. She's Americanized, mm -hmm. she's in her 30s, she's not at all like her mother. So it was quite, um, it was easier than it might have been to keep the voices distinct. Yeah, keep going back and forth. Yeah. She, um, 
Lady Virginia Holt is clearly so stuffy and she has a lot to hide. Why do I think it was a lot of fun for you to write her? It was huge fun. <laughs> She's a caricature in a lot of ways, but she, she's got these really great personality. You know? I was fascinated with how it really feels to be that person. Mm -hmm. That You know, because beneath all of that um, stiff upper Bro lip, lip I was just going to say, yeah, yeah. say it, yeah. There's a beating heart. Mm -hmm. There's a mother who loves her daughter. There's a mother who loved, a woman who loved a man very much. Mm -hmm. um, and who has had to suppress a lot of things to perform the role she does as Lady Holt. So I really wanted to dig down. I loved writing the facade, but I wanted to dig down beneath it to because discover who's there. She says something, and then we get to see how she really feels because it's in the first person. And so yeah. I said that, and I didn't really wish I said that. And yeah. it's that's not the way I really feel. And yeah. it was just so interesting to see her as a character evolving yeah. as time goes on. I think on. she has so many obligations as well mm -hmm. in her role. In her role, and, and this is how things are done. And there's yes. so many people that, I think life has changed a lot, that things, so many of the um, other generations don't feel that way. Yes. And I'm seeing that, I don't know anyone who says, like, this is exactly the way you have to do things. This is exactly the way we have to do this. Uh, and, but this woman is so trapped in her whole world, even though there's money, wealth, fame, all this kind of stuff, she's trapped. And it's, and she feels it every single day. You're right. And that's what her daughter fears. She's mm -hmm. always seen it as more of a cage. And she across the Atlantic to live in the US to escape it, and now she's back. Yeah, and it was so interesting that she had to come back because of her immigration issues. Yes. And I thought, oh my gosh, I thought she was getting married. It was like, you know, it was yeah. all gonna be over. <laughs> but she had to leave, and yeah. she had to leave everything she knew. And I did love that she's still in touch with the American moms when she's running into problems with Ruby, yeah. because those are the people she knew. Her she does tribe. She hasn't really formed a new tribe here because these moms don't really like her because she's from America. And I think that that's where we get that things really haven't changed. That's where we're yes. seeing that those women are still trapped in their, not their, um, not their old ways like Virginia, but it's just you're an outsider. Yes. And she's yes. very, very much an outsider. Yeah, I think, I think it is. It's just another thing that contributes to her feeling of isolation. And she's not in a good place to present herself no. as a very attractive person socially. She's too you know, depressed by her situation. She's yeah. grieving. And she's grieving. I mean, her, her father, and it's, it was interesting because it was just a couple of months before, her father yeah. and her husband. So then yeah. the men in their world are gone. No one has a man to rely on, nope. either that or someone to bounce ideas off nope. on or support structure. It's just three women in the support structure with this young girl. Yeah. So and, it's, and even if the young character was a boy, it would have been different. It, yes. The whole dynamic That's would have right. been completely different. Yeah. yeah. So the house and the grounds are really characters unto themselves in this book. And you could feel like looking out of this little window and where Hannah's room was. And when you were doing this, did you actually sketch what you saw the house was going to look like and how, the, how it was going to come? I like might have done them? if I could sketch. <laughs> <laughs> but I am rubbish at art. Um, I did visit a house um, which is fairly near to where I live and really used it as a model. But otherwise, I just had a very strong picture of, in my head of mm -hmm. where, what Joe's room should be like and what it would look out onto. And yeah. It was, yeah, it, it was just something that you were, you just felt that this place was such a, uh, character in the book and you feel like the house was talking the house had like you know yeah. there was things that happened in the father's office and there were secrets that the house as a character kind of knew and everybody else sort of have to unpeel them and figure out what was yeah. going on and I found that was to be really dramatic by uh, by setting it there and having a place where you were in a somewhat a locked room kind of a setting uh -huh. by yeah. having that were there things that really work for you in doing that, or did you run into any obstacles in that locked room kind of a feeling? I think it worked fine for this book um, because it was really important. It's so much part of the, the claustrophobia, the house itself, and the hundreds of years of history. Not just um, secrets from the recent past, but secrets from hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it worked very nicely for me. And I think wider than the house is the village community attached to it right. and all of that. I was thinking a lot of Ruth Ware's books when I was reading this. Yes. Because Ruth always does that locked in. And I, I, I always joke with people, if you don't have internet, but not a lot of stuff can't happen because you can't look things up. You can't. Yeah. So you're either on a boat or you're here or you're there. And here you're like trapped in the past. So even though you do have access to the internet or whatever, you're still trapped in the past. Absolutely. That was really, I, I just noticed that. 
Um, the halts are more than a bit dysfunctional. And if I were the nanny, I'm not sure I would have come back. I mean, I'm not really sure I would have done to that family. You reminded me again and again how having a nanny in your house is you're having this other personality and you have this other personality that's going to share their thoughts and feelings and influences on your family and it's not a member of your family. So was that, when, when you were thinking about who was going to come back and it was going to be the nanny, was that an easy character to be thinking about? It was um, easy in the sense that there was so much potential for it to go wrong mm -hmm. when you have a nanny. Um, and funnily enough, I was, when I was launching the book um, in the UK, I was approached by a woman who said, I am a nanny, and you absolutely nailed the extremely close relationship we form with other people's children. Wow. Which I, which I, felt, I felt a little flattered by, which was right. nice, but I also felt really pleased about because that's crucial to this book it is you know yeah, she needs to be right in there and almost and and know almost more than anybody else about and everyone. yet what i loved is that ruby is the one that like i don't like this woman yeah i don't like what's going on and i couldn't figure out if, because she knew she had a relationship with her mother in the past and i don't want to be friends with somebody who's friends with my mom she, or right. was she just so prescient about what was going on because she's such a precocious little girl she must have been a blast to write. <laughs> she was a blast. I think Ruby reads people very well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, she has a lot of other issues going on. She's grieving herself, so she's a little hostile too. So yeah, readers will find out if she's right or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's got this cute little voice and, you know, and I just love when it opens where they're having tea and yes. then she's celebrating her birthday yes. and it's going to be this perfect little thing. But Ruby is constantly on her iPad and I'm trying to figure out if I, if it was like a red herring there or what was Ruby really doing? And I don't want to give anything away for people, but it was so funny because Ruby's always on an iPad. I'm like, what is Ruby figuring out? What is Ruby looking at? And you're like, too much screen time. And it's really funny because so many parents are complaining right now about too much screen yeah. time. And you and I have both have children that are older. Like yes. we, have, we have children that are older. Yeah. So screen time before was like Game Boy. Like you just yes. took Game Boy away yeah. and that's all you had to take away. Now, Everybody, like you see children in the supermarket, like staring at the like screens as they, there's like no downtime and looking away from it. And it used to be something really big in the suburban town where we live in. If you had a DVD player in the back of your car, there's some mothers used to play it on the way to like downtown to the food store. Like let's pop a DVD in. And I said, can they just look out the window? Like yes, something? yes, because otherwise you miss life. It's gone. But now I realize screen time is a really big deal because the children are on this like all the time with absolutely no parental controls in a lot of ways about how to get them to stop and start because they'll find it. You're back on that, that iPad again. You're back doing this. And I think part of the problem is, and I'm guilty of this myself, I'm on my screen all the time Exactly, as well. exactly. So it's hard to police them if you look at your own phone. You know, it's funny, when I first started the company, people used to say, oh, you don't want to we'll see what your kids are doing online, and you know, they could be doing these things on Facebook and all this stuff. And I said, I have made this all seem so boring because it's part of my job. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that they sit and look at this and go, gosh, she does it. It's so boring. It's like not even very, very interesting. That's why my she's children won't write books or read them, probably. <laughs> so they're like, oh, that's what mom does all day long. Yeah. She's always online, you know? But, but. So, Virginia's husband, who's passed away, was kind of a cad. I he mean, was a we're cad. We're going to learn so much about what he was being a cad. And it's a departure about what we know about Virginia, like why she was even attracted to this guy and kept this stiff upper lip all this year. And we learn about him in little bits and pieces yes. throughout the book. How much fun was it unraveling him for the readers? Because we don't hear about him up front just from Joe coming back and going, my dad was this, 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 this. It's all like kind of little pieces along the way. Yeah, I wanted to build that in slowly so that the reader could form a picture of him and his relationship with both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was nice to sort of dribble that through. And Jo also finds out things she didn't know about him, mm -hmm. which adds to the yes. intrigue as we go along. And I think that's important. I always like to present characters who aren't we're not quite sure about. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, but there are a lot of them in here yes. that we're not quite sure <laughs> yeah. about what's going on. So in the beginning of the book, I'm not giving anything away, there's a skull that's found right at the very beginning. Right. And this the skull is like, where did it come from? It's out on this, you know, off this island. Like, you know, where did this, who is this? Where did it come from? How long has it been there? And remember, the house has been around for years. So it yes. could have been from, you know, centuries ago yes. or whatever. Now, I found it interesting that there wasn't a full body. It was just a skull. Yes. And was it always a skull right from the beginning that you were going to just have the skull? Yes, because I want... Well, they find a few other bones, but right. not, not a sort of complete... I think because I... 
this is the macabre thriller oh. for me. I had the image of the little girl holding the skull. Mm -hmm. Ruby finds it, which is not a spoiler, but she's, she's with her mom. And this image of Joe, her mother, just horrified, hor just <laughs> frozen, right, and um, paralyzed with this terrible feeling that something's very wrong. And of course, she links it in her head to her nanny's disappearance. And as the book goes along, we find out whether that skull did belong to her nanny or not. Right, because when Hannah comes back, we're not sure who Hannah really is. We're right. not sure if Hannah's Hannah or the skull's Hannah. Yeah. We're not really quite yeah. sure for a very long time. Exactly. So lots of forensics went into determining who the skull is. And uh -huh. I found that was because there's a detective that's also involved now. Yes. And the detective is coming in to look at the skull. And it becomes this another character in the book, yes. a third person character. And he's doing all this research. What kind of research did you do to figure out the forensics of discovering? Because they find out an awful lot about the skull, which I found was so interesting. I love, I'm fascinated by forensics. Um, I read a very good book by Val McDermott. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't recall the title, but it'd be easy to find. It's about forensics. And so I took a lot of information from, from there. there. I did a lot of online research. Um, I've always been fascinated by facial reconstruction when mm -hmm. they use the clay to rebuild the face. And I've always wanted to put it in a book. So this is the book oh, it goes into. Um, and I do have a, um, some detectives I talk to um, just to get to figure out right. you know, the, um, the, the, the actual um, little nuances and details yes. of it. But as they start unraveling it, and they don't know everything at the beginning, no. they know pieces and they don't know the whole thing. I just found that like so fascinating. And, and yes, it's right. When Ruby's sitting there holding that skull, it's like such a chilling thought for any mom to sit yes. there and say, this is what happened. When you were writing, you have three children. Yes. Was any of Ruby and any of, any of your children in Ruby? Or is uh, totally I think a little bit. Um, all of my children, when, when I, I love it when my children um, kind of don't necessarily toe the party line, but you know, when they have an th original thought, thought or they start to make an original judgment, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a moment to really celebrate, and Ruby embodies that. That kind of a yeah, feeling. So, yeah, they're definitely in her. Yeah, it was, it was, she's just such a cute character. Yeah. Now, you lived in California for a while, Correct. as did Joe and her children yes. and her daughter and Ruby. Um, I love that they continue to keep in touch with the moms and everything. Yep. Did you really enjoy your time in California? Wayne, how long were you there? I was 18 when my parents moved there, oh. so yes. I oh, you had a great time. time. Northern yes. California or Southern? Northern. Oh, okay. Menlo Park. Nice. Before the before Silicon the Valley, Valley explosion. Right. Um, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I think my dad did too. I think if he could have stayed there forever, he would have. Was it for work that he moved there? Yeah, he, he had a three year placement. Oh, so okay. I kind of so went backwards eight, and forwards a bit. 18 to 21. 18 to yeah. 21, when you were there? Oh, how fun. And then I met a guy in New York, so I stayed on a bit. You met a guy in New York? Yeah. It? So that's a whole other story. Oh my gosh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, please me too, you had a background in art and photography. And yes. I think that that's the reason that you're, I feel that you actually are writing photographically. And you're, it, all the imaging is very, very strong and fleshed out, where a lot of people would just paint a really top line picture. Mm -hmm. I saw a place. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that that your photography and art backgrounds contributed through the years? I think it helps hugely. Um, firstly, because studying art history teaches you how to convert what you see into words. You pretty much learn how to write about what you see. Mm. And so if I imagine a scene, that comes easily. And also I, s I imagine my scenes with, with kind of sharp focus on a few details. Mm -hmm. and that helps me kind of write them and I, and I try and include as many of those as are reasonable. As reasonable as you can yeah. do. Yeah, because I just found that the study of art has to have influenced how beautifully you wrote about setting. Because the setting is, like I said, the, the, the house is a character, but everything around is so beautifully described that I felt like I could see it. And there's sometimes you're reading a book and you're not quite sure. You're feeling a little right. bit more uneasy, but yeah. I definitely felt like that was going there. Um, you've taught photography. Does knowing what goes into a great picture help you in this Instagram crazy kind of days? Like that yes. you're sitting there taking these beautiful pictures? It, it does help um, massively, I think. Yeah, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good background to have. Yeah, I mean, last week I was, it was funny because I was shooting, I was sitting and reading all weekend. It was a long weekend. And I said, oh, I'm going to sit and, you know, just sit outside and read. I was reading kind of like a book a day. We didn't have any social obligations. It was absolutely fabulous. Lovely. It was lovely. Yeah. I was always doing was making dinners, which I love to do, and reading. And everybody does these really beautiful Instagram pictures all the time. And I was just sticking the book into like a flower pot that looked good with it or <laughs> laying it by the side of the pool. And like, I, I bet other people like, like a coffee cup and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I really don't have time for props. I have yeah. time to read and take a picture and that's about yeah. it. 
Well, that's but, your signature. No props. <laughs> <laughs> no props on yeah. mine. No props on mine. I'm laughing because you have your, my favorite color. You're wearing your turquoise nail polish that works so well with the book. So I thought, oh, we could just like, you know, color coordinate here. Yeah. But I find that it's now, it's not just about writing the book anymore. It's about being your own little engine, about going it out is. to get this book a cover reveal, a this, that, the other yeah. thing that layers a whole different kind of energy onto what you have to do with the book. I agree, and, and that is something I'm very much still learning. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, a very steep learning curve for, for authors who haven't been in, for example, journalism before. We wrote a novel. Um, I was a housewife. I knew I was not even on Facebook. Right. So for me, the learning curve has been like that. You wrote a lot of really good excuse notes for school, absentee yes. notes, things right. like that that have absolutely no bearing on what we're doing right exactly, now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you're right. You do have an engine of your own is a really good description. That's what it feels like. Yeah. yeah. And and you're just constantly trying to say, and I look at sometimes what people do, and I was like, that would be so much work. I'd much rather just go write about it and write something clever yeah. or just write. Because sometimes yeah. this, I think there's this constant need that we're feeling right now to be pithy and clever and whatever, instead of just saying, this is why I want you to go read this book. That's it. You know, yes. we don't have to, let's not drill down any further on it. Yeah. So did you know the ending in this book right from the beginning? When you first started writing, did you know what you were going to do? Not the details. Mm -hmm. um, I knew the broad strokes. Broad strokes. Yeah. I was going to go on. Yeah. So what do you enjoy more, writing or rewriting? Editing? Like, do you do the rough first draft? And then from there, it's like polishing. I love and hate both, mm -hmm. depending on the day. Okay. Um, I can have a fantastic day on a first draft. Gorgeous writing flows. You think, oh, gosh, I'm good at this, and then the following day, you know, it all crashes down. Got nothing. Got yeah. nothing. I, I really love the, um, I love the editing because I, I quite like taking a paragraph and thinking, golly, this could be so much better. I'm quite mm -hmm. good at seeing what I need to do, mm -hmm. um, but I find it, it's tiring when it's a whole book, and because you've just written a draft, that can be the, the tiring bit of the process. Yeah, and it's I mean, just like, just get this, and then. How do I make it better? Yeah, like and you're reading it again and again, the same stuff. And I think that so many times readers don't know how many times you read the yeah. book and how many times, and I've had you know, so many authors say, if I'm not in love with the book, then I can't do it because I'm going to spend so much more time with this book yes. than anybody knows, promoting it and whatever. And if your heart's not in it. Yes. And it's happened. I know it's happened with people. And you can tell because you don't feel like the same oomph about that particular book. Right. But you're on a contract, a deadline, and this, that, yeah. the other, what yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. So the nanny is dedicated to your agent, Helen Heller, who I know. and, and My fabulous you're, agent, Helen you're, Heller. Oh, well, she's <laughs> referred to as, let me just read this, folks, agent extraordinaire, fashion guru, family accent coach, and friend. Now, I know Helen, and I agree about how terrific she is, and I definitely agree about her great fashion sense. I was having dinner with her one night, and she bought this gorgeous piece of jewelry while she was waiting for me. <laughs> and we were having dinner in a place that was had a museum, and she had just bought this you know, fabulous piece. But tell me about the family accent coaching skills, because I've got to know what these are. So my son, Max, mm -hmm. um, he's 19. He is in a show called Call the Midwife, a okay. TV show, which oh, yeah. I think is here in the U.S. as okay. well. He plays a character called Timothy Turner. And the reason I tell you that is because it led to him getting an offer of a, a part in a movie. Oh, wow. And the movie is called Song of Names, and it's coming out, I believe, in 2019 or 2020. And they needed a, somebody who could play violin, which he can. Um, but they also needed somebody who had a Newcastle accent from uh -huh. up north uh -huh. in England, which is where Helen is from. So when we had the call from his agent saying, can you do the accent, I said to Max, can you? And he said, no. And I was like, I think I know someone who can help. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> so that's the answer. So folks, when you read the dedication, just know that we delved into that question and we have the right. answer for you. Yes. I love that. I love that. So it's like, I was like, wait, family I think I can coach. I, like, I love this. So when you, did you write, um, when you work with both your agent and your editor on this book, because I know that you said, you know, Helen was involved with helping you with the plot right at the beginning. Yes. Do you work with your agent first and then deliver it to your editor? Or what's that process like? Do yeah, you I work very closely with Helen. She's very involved um, and we talk about everything and she reads material and feeds back. And when she's happy and I'm happy with what we've done together, it goes to the editors. Mm -hmm. And it goes to my editor in New York and London simultaneously. Simultaneously. Okay, I was yeah. going to ask. Right. And, and then they both, um, do they each give you a set of notes and then you look at all their notes? Or do they, do they talk? 
before? They talk um, to each other, they talk to Helen, sometimes we all talk, um, but what we're aiming for is a consistent set of notes we're all agreed on before I start work. Okay, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Either that or you're going in two different directions Absolutely. with, you know, yeah. of what's going on. Um, are your books received differently in the UK and the US? Because there's sometimes that, like I remember years ago with Lynn Barker, we used to talk about child in peril works in the UK, but it doesn't oh. work in the US quite the same. Like there's certain things that it's the um, different cultures will adapt to better and not like you know over like, overlook. So you, do you see them received the same way? Uh, not um, historically. My mm -hmm. first four books did not do well in the UK. They did really well in North America, mm -hmm. um, but n pretty much nothing in my home market. Crickets, crickets at home. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lots of noise um, overseas. But yeah. this has changed for the nanny. Right. They, I think you said it hit the bestseller list in it, the it UK. Has, yes. Which, which is, is fabulous news. Thrilling. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. And this is also the first time you're going to be in hardcover in the States. Everything yes. was in trade paperback before yes. that. Yes, so. it is. And that was the same in the UK, actually. It's my first hardcover. So I'm probably grown, grown up oh, yeah. <laughs> good. It's, it's like this is what's going on. Yeah. Um, can you share anything about what you're working on now? Uh, I'm working on my next novel, which is actually about a writer. Mm. Um, something you know a little bit about. Something I know. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit about, you know. Uh, and a thriller writer who has to write a book a year. Right. Um, and <laughs> I, I, it's a kind of first person narrative, a bit of a journey into psychological terror. She has an interesting past in that she was with her younger brother when he was abducted. Ah. But she fails to remember. But everybody really wants her to. Wants to remember everything that had gone on. Yeah, okay. but she doesn't. And it let, yes, I, I don't want to say too much. No, don't say stage. too much, but it's, it's a little, a little bit it's about a writer, folks. So we know it's something that she knows. Right. There's, there, there's no skull coming in right at the beginning right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so much fun. So, okay, I love this book. And you've got four others that I easily could dip into. Which one do you think I should pick up next? What um, would you say? If you've loved The Nanny, I'd recommend The Perfect Girl. The Perfect Girl. Which is my okay. second novel. Perfect. Yes. That's, well, that's the perfect book for me to go read next. Perfect. <laughs> and with that, I thank you so much for joining me today. We only met yesterday for the first time, but I feel like I've made a friend that I'm going to look forward to seeing on the road and here uh, many more times to come. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Carol. So much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, this is from bookreporter.com talks to. Having a great day.